welcome to how to stop a rogue prime minister uh thank you very much for coming so it's just gone 7 p.m we're finished about 8 30 so we have about an hour and a half uh my name is jessica metheringham the chair of unlock democracy uh plus also your chair for tonight and just before we start that i wanted to say a couple of words about unlock democracy we're obviously campaigning for a better politics, you know, a better democracy, and that means political processes which are fair, which are transparent, which are representative, which are supported by a written constitution. Now, of course, you know, there's more than one way to improve decision making, but we all know that our politics is broken at the moment. Um, so please do uh, come and help us to fix it. For members, we have an event next Thursday, um, which I will just mention at the end as well. But tonight we have some excellent speakers, uh, two of whom are here already, the third of which we are expecting shortly. And they will each speak for a few minutes each, then we'll move on to some questions. So our speakers tonight, we have uh, Dr. Hannah White, uh, from the Institute for Government. Thank you very much for coming and welcome. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, Ben Worthy uh, from Birkbeck University of London. And thank you very much for coming as well. So welcome to our panel, both of you. Uh, perhaps I could ask Hannah and then Ben to spend seven or eight minutes. But just before that, I would say that the third plans we're waiting for, uh, we're waiting for Anthony Bar uh, Barnett um, from Open Democracy, who also used to be the director for Charter 88, which was Unlock Democracy's predecessor. So, you know, these things tend to come around. But uh, let's start with uh, Hannah. Would you be able to set out in you know seven or eight minutes, you know, how to stop a rogue prime minister? Uh, thank you very much um, for inviting me uh, to discuss this interesting question um, at this uh, timely moment. I think as we're about to see a, a new prime minister, um, and as we've just seen the well about to see the exit of, of another one. I guess confronted with this question, it, it immediately made me sort of think about the terms of the question. Um, what is a rogue prime minister? Who gets to define what a rogue prime minister, what rogue means? And, and who do we think is going to try and, and stop or should be able to try and stop a prime minister? So that's what I wanted to kind of reflect on a bit. Um, I guess thinking about it and thinking about recent history, if, you, if you're talking about someone who is a rogue prime minister, you're not just talking about someone who doesn't do what you wanted them to do when they got into power. So you're, you're not talking about a sort of necessarily Theresa May being removed because she failed to deliver on Brexit, which was the kind of ostensible, the, the reason that the sort of Conservative Party decided to get rid of her. What you, I mean, and you know, separate argument about whether you think Theresa May in some ways was a rogue, rogue prime minister and some people might think that but um that was not why she was why she was removed uh, I assume if you're saying rogue you mean somebody who has got to the point where they're not following the rules um as as most people would accept them which is closer to the justification for for why Boris Johnson lots of people uh, lots of members of parliament decided that Boris Johnson uh, should go but I think this, this sort of reveals one of the problems, which is the difficulty in defining who, what sort of rule breaches are serious enough to say that you are a rogue prime minister and they should therefore leave. And as I kind of, I was trying to think about in rough ascending order, what you might do wrong in order to be defined as, as rogue. So, and curiously, quite a lot of these examples relate to Boris Johnson. But um, so the, the, the first one, I think, you know, at, at the lowest level, you might have established constitutional processes that uh, you just contest their validity. So you sort of say, well, this shouldn't apply uh, to, to my mates. So a good example here was the Owen Patterson case where the uh, he had been found to have broken the, the rules in Parliament and uh, uh, the government said, actually, we don't like the rules. So that, I guess, is the kind of one level of being rogue. Then you can move up to kind of, uh, are you going to ignore sort of ethical conventions? Um, uh, around, say, for example, what the Nolan principles say about how people should conduct themselves in public life. Uh, beyond that, you might get to the point where you're actually breaking formal ethical rules. Um, so, say, for example, the rules in the MP's code of conduct, 
Um, we you know, regularly see MPs do that. Uh, we've also seen uh, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister be uh, chastised by the Standards Committee for not following some of the financial de declaration rules. Um, then if you take a, a step up again, there are sort of constitutional conventions that you might uh, decide to flout. For example, things which are set out in the Cabinet Manual about how ministers should be behave themselves. Then I guess the step up again would be allowing or encouraging um, other people to ignore rules or, or break the law, which I guess we saw during Partygate. Um, breaking the law yourself uh, and being found to have done so. Um, and then I guess at the top of the tree, I put it, but this is obviously debatable, is being prepared to, to break international law uh, and affecting the sort of perceptions of the country in that way. So that's my, that was my kind of hierarchy of possible breaches, which might end, end up with people just concluding that you were a rogue prime minister. I'm sure you could put other things in and you might contest the order. Um, I think the point is that different people would contest that. Different people would say these are, uh, are different levels of breaches. They are more or less serious. And we do, you wouldn't get necessarily a level of agreement on whether it meant that uh, somebody should be removed. Um, and also these things change over time, right? So something that might have been sufficient to say a prime minister is a rogue prime minister 50 years ago might be quite different today. So I think one of the things which definitely sort of flowed from Boris Johnson, experience of Boris Johnson was, is this question about the ministerial code. Um, so uh, things that we saw that he did that uh, were contraventions of the ministerial code about not breaking the law and so on. Um, and but for the first time, we really saw how the ministerial code is inadequate when it comes to a prime minister themselves uh, being accused of breaching it. And that's how we got into the whole Sue Gray uh, investigation scenario. Um, but this is just a really difficult question, right? So if, if you're saying the ministerial code doesn't work when it comes to a prime minister, who are you saying can judge a prime minister in those circumstances? So then I think we say, OK, well, there are probably three sets of, of, of people who um, can judge a, a prime minister. There's uh, their own party, there's MPs in parliament, and then there's the electorate in general. But I think one of the problems, uh, again, is that with the systems we have currently set up, those three different sets of people have quite different levels of agency in order to try to, re to remove a prime minister. And so for the different political parties, there are different rules about how many MPs have to trigger a process and who then gets a say over the process and so on. Those are in the hands of the political parties. Um, and one of the things we've really seen clearly is that there's a confusion between mandates for getting rid of prime ministers. And we've seen this, um, uh, I guess you, you can think about it across leaders, not just prime ministers, but leaders of parties. So, for example, when Labour MPs decided they wanted to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn and voted to say they wanted to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn, he said, oh, but, you know, I have the support of the membership of the party, so I shouldn't step down. Um, that would have been the same process had he been prime minister at the time. Conservative MPs um, arguably sort of hung on to, to Johnson as a leader at a time when polling said that the public wanted him to step down. Um, Johnson said, you know, actually, I have a personal mandate from the last election when uh, I was elected as the, the head of the Conservative Party, therefore I shouldn't step down. So there's all these different mandates in play. Um, uh, and again, you have sort of a similar thing with Theresa May, uh, where some MPs wanted to get rid of her, and they said that the referendum was more of a man the outcome was more of a, a mandate, and she wasn't delivering on that than MPs, um, uh, than the sort of vote of confidence which she had won. So one of the questions I wanted to raise is, is whether, you know, given all this confusion of mandates, uh, it's right that a prime minister can only ultimately be removed uh, by some, a process which gets triggered within Parliament. Um, so is it right that, um, or, or should there be any form of external trigger to Parliament? So it's not just MPs who get to, to kick off a process of, of getting rid of a leader. Now, arguably, that yes, that is right, you know, in our system, it's not a presidential system, as uh, I was keen to say when um, Boris Johnson was claiming a personal mandate, and we say we have parties within our system and parties choose their leaders, and then those are the people who, um, who become prime minister, if that is the most successful party in an election. Um, 
but uh, the process over the last few weeks has caused a lot of people to question whether that is right and whether that it, it is appropriate with a sitting um, uh, party to choose their own election, uh, to choose their own prime minister. So is it right that MPs have so much control of the process? Should be that there be some way for the public to, to trigger, to signal concern with a, a prime minister and, and to kick off the process in some way, as we have, for example, with the recall of MPs Act for MPs specifically? And then just quickly to close, I mean, I think one of the problems with this whole idea of a rogue prime minister uh, is, is the fact that ultimately they're acting within a system, but they also have a lot of agency to change the system themselves. So if there are rules or norms which are inconvenient to them because they are prime minister, they can change those. And we've seen that with the advisor on ministerial interests. Um, Boris Johnson saying that, you know, not bothering to reappoint someone after he'd lost two of them. Uh, Boris Johnson changing the ministerial code to remove references to the Nolan principles and so on. Um, one, one thing that can, should concern us, I think, if we don't like the activities of a prime minister is also the, 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 their ability to change the system. And, and this is comes back to what you were saying, Jessica, about potentially the attractions of a, of a written constitution in that context. Um, so a question again, I think for us is, is our ethical system sufficiently well embedded? Um, should it be so easy to change it? Should it be so easy for, for prime ministers to be able to change it? Um, you know, we don't have sort of constitutional entrenchment mechanisms. Constitution, constitutional change is mechanically relatively easy uh, in our system. Is that is that right? Um, and then I just think there's, there's one final question I, want, uh, I was reflecting on and thinking about this question is, all the constituencies I mentioned, MPs um, and uh, parties and the public, there's always a tendency to judge what, an, what a prime minister is doing in quite a tactical way. <clears throat> and one of the things I think about a lot is the sort of cumulative long-term effect of the, of, of the actions of a prime minister and a leader and what that does to the system within which they're operating. And it seems to me that often it's the precedents that are set, whether or not they actually end up having immediate consequences, which are the problematic things. So it's the fact of ignoring a rule, it's the fact of reinterpreting a, a, a norm or whatever. And that having happened, um, just loosens the sort of the constraints within which we're all operating the way the system is supposed to work. And, and does that lead to a sort of slippery slope and a sort of erosion of our, of our, of our system? Um, and I just guess there's a question around who, who's looking out for that? Who, who is thinking about that and, and whether that is a problem? Because, you know, MPs are mostly focused on, is this the right person to win us the next election? Um, the public are focused on what they're sort of being told on a day-to-day -day basis by the media rather than a sort of a longer term uh, view. Parties are interested in being in power. Who is looking after the, the system as a whole? So those are my uh, few thoughts to kick us off. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you. I mean, Personally, I've come away from that, you know, uh, with more questions, of course, you know, asking myself, you know, uh, you know, this, that slow shifting of the window of normality, how does that affect it and who's looking out for it is a really uh, pertinent way of addressing that question. Um, we are joined by Anthony as well. Uh, um, uh, sorry about, you know, the technical difficulties there. <laughs> Never mind. We'll come to you afterwards. I'll come to Ben first. So um, Ben Worthy from uh, the Department of Politics at Birkbeck. Uh, could you take seven or eight minutes just to to try to answer this question about, you know, how we stop a road prime minister? I, I can indeed. I'll, I'll do my best. And I think a lot of what I say actually follows on from, uh, from what uh, Dr. White has just said um, and actually perhaps proposes some of the, the possible solutions. So um, my main research areas are in prime ministerial power and government transparency. I think some of these issues will, will come up in what I say and probably in the discussion later. I've just spent the last two years doing a project looking at how people are using new forms of data as they hold politicians to account. Just before I go through some of the kind of democratic reform options, I wanted to just kind of remind ourselves how democratic checks are supposed to function in the abstract and they're supposed to work broadly in kind of two ways which I could label anticipation or response. So one way in which democratic checks are supposed to function is by deterring bad behaviour before it happens. The mere existence of a check is supposed to make a politician 
The other way is the kind of retrospection or reaction, and this means if a politician has misbehaved or gone rogue in some way, then there'll be sufficiently kind of strong or powerful punishments or sanctions so that it'll never happen again. And um, as Hannah said so clearly, one of the real problems is that lots of the supposed checks in our uncodified constitution simply haven't worked or have kind of faded into insignificance. Whether it's the kind of constitutional checks, the ministerial code, that is a kind of code and a guide to how ministers should and shouldn't behave. The independent um, advisor on ministerial interests, two of whom have stepped down in the space of one premiership. Um, and also the more political checks, these famous political checks that are supposed to exist, such as members of the cabinet who were supposed to hold a rogue prime minister in check. They haven't happened either. So we were left in this frankly bizarre situation where we were awaiting a report from a civil servant. Then we were awaiting the Metropolitan Police. And then finally, Fighting the actions of uh, conservative backbenchers who had, as, as, as Hannah says, very political instincts about why they should. So I just wanted to go through a few of the possible options. I know Anthony will, will, will pick up on this uh, probably in more detail, but option one is the big one, which is a written constitution. Would codifying uh, the constitution actually help stop a rogue prime minister? I think the answer there is, is yes. Uh, it would depend very much on what the written constitution looked like, how different it was from the present arrangements, but it would probably do one of two things. One, it would set out much more clearly the red lines, formally, so that we could see more quickly where a prime minister has transgressed and, and, and gone rogue, often linked to an important democratic principle like the rule of law, which is something Boris Johnson has been accused of breaking on numerous occasions. And secondly, again, depending on the shape the UK's written constitution would take, it would probably have more powerful separation of powers. So there'd be a stronger judiciary and legislature to hold the leader to account. Now, I'm not saying this is a magic bullet. This is not a perfect solution. And if we point to two political leaders who have a very strong resemblance to Boris Johnson, uh, Silvio Berlusconi in Italy and uh, Donald Trump in the United States. Both of those leaders, despite having a written constitution, did test and push the boundaries and try and undermine them in some, some frankly rather kind of terrifying ways. But whether written constitutions in both those countries really came in, responding to what they did. Silvio Berlusconi's policies and actions were stopped by the Constitutional Court, they were stopped by the indirectly elected president, and also by a, a referendum on some of his more radical reforms in 2006. Similarly, Donald Trump, as we know even now, um, some of his wilder policies were stopped by judges, and the, the uh, legislature continues to investigate the things that Donald Trump has done. So broadly, a written constitution probably if we elected the House of Commons by proportional representation, that would mean the Prime Minister would be part of a coalition. Uh, coalitions were a very powerful check on Silvio Berlusconi, and actually they were part of the reason for his downfall. A stronger House of Lords, an elected House of Lords, for example, would have a much stronger veto power. We've already seen the present House of Lords uh, trying to stop policies around the breaking of international law, um, around the internal market bill in the past and now over. Um, there's some other interesting ideas floating around. Um, Hannah's book covers this really well, but perhaps strengthening the power of select committees or even the liaison committee. Ben, um, could I just break in there to ask, uh, would it be possible for you to put the microphone slightly closer to your mouth? Would yes, that work? Is that better? That is better, I think, uh, but okay. I'm not quite sure whether it's going to stay better. Okay. Let's uh, try. Give me a wave. Um, the other... Chris Monaghan has raised is about um, the idea that we could recreate the power of impeachment. This is the idea that fell into abeyance late 18th century, but his suggestion is that we use a House of Commons and independent court to create a new power of impeachment. Finally, another suggestion is to simply to make what the Prime Minister does more transparent. One of the real problems we've seen around Boris Johnson is the way in which interests and other kind of aspects have been simply hidden. So um, I, before I hand over to Anthony, I just wanted to, to make kind of three broad suggestions for what a good democratic check should look like. One, it should be linked to some sort of transparency, because one of the reasons that Boris Johnson has prospered is because lots of the facts were difficult to establish. Um, it was kind of 
hidden with investigation and denial that made it hard to know when a wrong had been done and rogue behavior had happened. So we need greater transparency. I point here to things like Open Democracy's campaign around ministerial meetings and publishing them. Secondly, there needs to be stronger checks and balances that can work either to deter or respond when bad behavior happens. And finally, something that's slightly overlooked in lots of discussions around what's happened with Boris Johnson is those checks and balances to be operated by people who are willing and able to use them so that we don't have to wait around for particular politicians or bodies to respond often at the very last minute. But we know that there are people that are independent and powerful enough sufficiently to take action when it needs to happen. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, sorry about the sound quality uh, there to everyone. This is one of the issues with Zoom, I'm afraid. So um, we will do our best to try to fix that. Could I uh, uh, welcome Anthony now? Um, thank you for joining us. Lovely to have you here. Um, would you like to take up this mantle then, you know, and perhaps uh, briefly outline for us what you think the answer is to, you know, how do you stop a rogue prime minister? Hello, Anthony. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid you're still muted. <laughs> Aha, can you hear me here. now? We Is can. that better? Yes. Uh, Hello. I'm apologising. Hi there, because uh, there's COVID in the household and there was a panic business. So I have many... Uh, the plague is around us and takes many forms. One of them is electronic, but the other one, I'm afraid, is, um, is all too medical. Uh, uh, and it was a great pleasure listening to, to Hannah and to Ben. Um, I, I suppose the thing I really want to address is that I don't think there is any way of stopping a rogue prime minister by means of rules. So I'm very much in favour of the points that the, 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 the issues that Ben has said of transparency, of checks and balances, of having people that are willing to operate them. This is a crucial point because it means the political culture is at play and, and of having a written constitution. And I think um, the points that, that sort of Hannah is making about, uh, you know, it's quite interesting because Theresa May wasn't rogue. She didn't go rogue. I mean, there were reasons to oppose what she was doing and she became unpopular uh but but she was in her own way rather rule bound as a figure other prime ministers have gone rogue anthony eden secretly made a deal with the french and invaded suez um while while his you know while he was actually very ill and and arguably insane um and uh, and the so you know Johnson is, is, is a particular problem for us. And the particular problem that strikes me about Boris Johnson is that everybody knew he was a rogue in the criminal sense, seems to me, before he was elected. So there's very considerable evidence that the Tory party quite understood his nature, his rule-breaking character. Indeed, that's one of his attractions, as it was for Trump in the United States. The people felt, here's a guy who won't play by the rules. We need somebody who'll bust the rules, who'll be different. Um, and, and he indulged in that process. So the real issue, it seems to me, is to have a political culture where the people who are there believe in that political culture and believe that you ought to behave in a relatively rule bound fashion. So, for example, when Profumo resigned because he had lied to the House of Commons, I mean, just, you know, the number of times that had been documented, I, I lost count of them, of, of, of Johnson lying to the House of Commons. But there's now a final process over the over Partygate. Um, but that's just the tip of an iceberg of, of dishonesty. So people no longer cared if somebody had had an affair with somebody and lied to the House of Commons. It wouldn't lead to a, a vast political crisis. Um, and therefore, if you're going to say, well, now we need to have a, a much clearer, more transparent rule based process, which I think both Hannah in a different way and Ben are saying, where we understand what is going on and who is to do what, 
we need to have um, a political culture, including within the media and the public and voters that believe in this, that want, want this to come about and want to have this. And therefore, for me, the opportunity of having moving to a, a, a democratic constitution is not writing it down. Because we now know from, from the, the experience of the United States, or indeed, as Ben said, in Italy, having a written constitution does not prevent a rogue prime minister from getting into office and behaving in a rogue fashion. What prevents it is when people believe in the values and the transparency of the constitutional order. So the crucial issue for moving to a, 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 an honest constitutional framework and an honest government is the process by which we arrive there. If you said, as I think, you know, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Kenneth Clark is an interesting example, because when I was founded Charter 88, we tried to lobby Kenneth Clark, who dismissed the idea of freedom of information and a written constitution as absolute nonsense and, and in a very cynical and, 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 and slovenly fashion. Um, and now he has come out publicly to say we need a written constitution because he says the system is no longer working. But what he wants is he wants what he experienced as existing under Thatcher when there was genuine cabinet government to be recorrected by somebody sitting around a committee and issuing rules saying, we'll have these rules, we'll now have this rule, we'll ask, we'll ask Hannah to uh, to oversee them, to look after them, and that all will be solved. But if the public don't believe in it, it's not going to stop anybody from misbehaving. So you need a process, a constitutional process, where of a public, of a deliberative kind, where people say, okay, this is, you know, writing down a constitution is not a very difficult thing to do, but the process needs to be one where people feel this is the kind of country we are, this is what we want to be. This is, and, and at that point, you have checks and balances can really mean something. And the terrible thing about what happened with Boris Johnson is that um, nobody really cared. But right? in the end, it became intolerable. But but actually, he was permitted. And 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 to give you one small example, which I'm very exercised about, one of the things that Johnson did was to push through. ID cards for voting. Now, Open Democracy ran an article by David Davis, a very good article by David Davis, a Tory MP, saying there was no problem with a, a voter identification. It's not an issue. The use of ID cards is a clear act of voter suppression taken from the Republican playbook. And it will probably lead to about a million people less voting and they won't be Tory voters on the whole. And that's what it's about. Now, has the opposition, Her Majesty's opposition, made a fuss about this? No, it hasn't. You know, it's not a public issue. And the public are therefore right to feel that nobody really cares whether they vote or not. I mean, except, or they're rather, if in, in as far as they do, they only care to make sure they do. It's more difficult. So there isn't a public sense of belief in our public order. That's what's really going rogue. And I say that because Historically, despite having an unwritten constitution in the 19th century, there was a very profound belief in British constitutional culture. Gladstone called upon the constitution when he changed his mind about, you know, voting reform. And, and that constitution, that process, it became Fabianized, it became, as Ferdinand Mount has shown, it became centralized. But there was a, a but in, in the Second World War, there was a real belief that we knew how to govern ourselves and that there were ways of behaving. And that's what is stops there being rogue political leaders. And when that breaks down, as we have seen, it is breaking down at the moment in America, maybe restored, but if that breaks down as it has in the United Kingdom, then uh, that's what has to be addressed. And, uh, it's out of that shift that you can then come up with the processes unless people the political culture and the public believe in the processes uh, they won't of themselves protect us uh, from authoritarianism uh, or fascism or whatever you want to call it or, or rogueness
Thank so I don't you. want to splash a lot of cold water, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. I mean, sometimes cold water is very refreshing and sometimes it, it uh, spurs you on to ask more questions. Um, my main issue is that you have um, you have mainly answered the first question I was going to ask, which is uh, slightly frustrating here, but I think I need to ask it nonetheless, which is about, you know, you've all talked about, you know, whether a written constitution would or would not stop a rogue PM. But I think there's something there about how would it or would it not? Now, I know, Anthony, you've spoken about that a fair amount. And so I think my question for you specifically would be, how do you change the culture and how do you embed political values? Um, how do you get the population to really, you know, to take on these political values. You know, my my suggestion might be that if you name them in a constitution, then they are embedded in the population. You know, that they are something that people can point to and say, well, yes, that's one of our values because it's in the, the constitution. And, you know, I wondered what you felt about, you know, how we actually went around changing political culture, particularly when there's so much political noise. So if I can ask well, that how, question how, to you how, and how, then off to Hannah and Ben. OK, well, I'll tell you how I would do it, but I don't expect uh, there to be enormous agreement, alas. What I would like to see is, I first of all, I'd like to see Scottish independence, because I think the British narrative of Great Britain, we are a great historic country, is something which is blocking people from being able to reconstruct our political culture. If there were Scottish independence, there would be a constitutional convention in Scotland, and there would be massive public deliberation about what kind of constitution they want to have, what rules they want to have. And the English would say, well, if you can do, think you can do that, we can do that better. Because we have traditions going back to the levelers. We have, we were the first, we English were the first to say, let's have an agreement of the people. You know, there are deep roots of active decentralizing political democracy, which we can draw upon, you know, right the way through to Shelley. And, and, and at that point, I think, I far from believing, as I'm afraid most of my friends and colleagues do, that the English are intrinsically right-wing, red-faced Tories. I think that we're uh, a, a profoundly rights-based and, and democratic country, really, really pissed off the elite uh, uh, that are, are governing us. And so I think at that point, a political party is needed, which says we need to have rules. We can't go on with House of Lords and all this stuff. Therefore, we need to have a public process, which will take a year or two years. South Africa did it with a very big citizen mobilization to produce its constitution. And, and Chile is doing it, I think, not in a way that I would you know, there are real problems with it, but it's happening. The internet allows deliberation. It needs to be a governed process, but an open and fair process of deliberation. And I think something efficient, decentralized would emerge from that quite naturally. And hopefully would also seek to, to rejoin the European Union, democratizing the European Union in that process. But it, this, 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 you may say this is utopia, and you may say this is something that only those who are under 30 could possibly uh, imagine and, and implement. Um, that's a sign of how profound a crisis Brexit and Johnson pre presents for us. Um, but that, that process, I have great confidence that if you, let me put it this way, when we were arguing for constitutional reform in the 1980s, the Charter 88, everybody said to us, the people, the previous generation to experts like Hannah said to us, it can't be done. Or if it could be done, it would take many years. And we said, no, it can be done. Now, what Labour did was they introduced a Scottish Parliament, a Welsh Assembly, Mayor for London, all based on referendums, a Human Rights Act, freedom of information, they abolished almost all hereditary peers, they did it in two years, and what and they've created the Supreme Court. And what is striking about this is that all those reforms have worked. That's to say, once you really empower the English with freedom of information, that created the parliamentary expenses crisis. 
The judges are showing their independence. The Human Rights Act is now pretty well irreversible and is written into the Good Friday Agreement. The Scottish Parliament is a great success. Welsh Assembly won by half a percent and, and is now immensely popular. So once you give people a real, not some consultation, but a real sense of empowerment, they'll, they'll, they, they, will, they will take it. The English will run for it. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why Brexit happened is because, you know, people said given an opportunity, that all it meant was you could either kick the establishment or not. And so they did. And so I think that process, uh, um, you know, that's what will shift the political culture. Uh, uh, people are longing for it. This is an honest country. They hate the corruption. They hate the dishonesty and they they despise it. And I think if people are given that power, then um, it will. Then it will that not will be, be the answer. Rogues. <laughs> Thank you. Give the power back to the people. Can I ask a uh, similar question uh, back to Hannah and then back to Ben? Then, which is around well, what what would you propose doing? You know, what sort of practical steps would you propose doing? Whether it is to uh, create a written constitution or some rules which can stop a uh, can stop a rogue prime minister. Um, you know, yeah. So, Hannah, what are your practical steps? Uh, so, I guess in my view, there were there was a sort of short term tactical stuff that we probably need to do uh, ahead of the possibility of a more radical shift. If if you think we need a written constitution. Uh, Yes, it is, you know, it's a, it's a longer term process and given some of the precedents that have been set, I think there are probably some things that need to be done in the meantime, even if you think that there's a, there's a, there's a longer term uh, process you want to get to. So I think there are some things around sorting out uh, the role of certain ethical advisors and the status of the ministerial code and some of these things where actually it's short of a written constitution but writing a bit more stuff down i think we there is widespread um agreement that it's all been a bit too vague and that good chaps doesn't work any longer um and that 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 ought to be done um so so that can be done uh by you know a political party with sufficient political will to do it um i think in terms of uh, actually getting to a written constitution. My view, I mean, Anthony's sort of precursor, which you require is Scottish independence. I think my precursor, which you require, is probably uh, electoral reform in terms of voting, the voting system, because our, the, the incentives in our two-party first-past-the-post system are just, are, are not there um, for either party to say, yes, this is a process we're willing to kick off because there's just too much potential downside. And when you empower the political capital, which you have to expend, even if it's the sort of grassroots, you know, bottom up process that Anthony describes, the, the political capital required to, to set that off um, is, is just not going to be there when you think of all the other priorities that, that political parties have, particularly in the sort of situation we currently find ourselves in. Um, so I think I think what you would have to have is a party uh, who wins an election, who uh, changes our voting system, um, and then uh, a government elected uh, as a result of the new voting system could kick off could, could kick off a process like this. I do think I mean I agree with a lot of what's been said about the benefits, uh, probable benefits of a, of a written constitution in terms of. Uh, if it creates if it creates the right culture, because I think sometimes people look at a written constitution as a sort of panacea. They say we've got all these problems in our state. What have we not got? We haven't got a written constitution. Oh well, that must be the answer. Um, and actually, uh, as already discussed, there's plenty of examples of countries uh, with written constitutions with with lots of similar problems. And it, it it does absolutely, I think, as Anthony says, need to be a uh, a sort of deliberative participative process that gets us to a constitution or you will not build that um, culture and you end up with the with the worst problem of uh, whoever the victors are embedding their version of what the constitution ought to be 
which has no legitimacy and doesn't actually uh, help when it comes to sort of when when that constitution is first put to the test if it's not owned um, in a quite a sort of uh, broad broad brush uh, way then it's not actually going to land us up in a better position um, because there are lots of unresolved questions in our constitution which are grey and which will need to be resolved in the process of, of producing a, a written constitution. Um, it's not just a question of of sort of writing it all down because it's also accepted and and um, and there are lots of things that uh, would need to be decided. Plus, we've also seen that sometimes when aspects of our written of our constitution have been written down, that doesn't do away with um, the uncertainty. So, if you look at say the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, of course that was written in haste, um, but didn't really help us when it came to to Brexit and and, and it being tested. So. It's really important that the the kind of um, the initiative behind the setting of the rules and the, and the, the norms and the values is uh, a process which uh, sort of society has has bought into, or it, it wouldn't be worth the paper it was written on. Thank you. Very good point there, especially around how when we try and write down part of something, then it often doesn't work. I mean, we need the whole thing, um, you know, but we also need it done properly. And uh, Ben, what's what's your view on some of the practicalities, you know, how you would go about doing this? Because you talked a lot about uh, the rules and the transparency and, you know, how would you do that? I think you perhaps went into slightly more detail than the other panellists. Yeah, I think, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I think um, it's, a, a as Hannah said, while we think about a written constitution, there's a few kind of necessary small steps. One is to create much greater transparency about what it is a prime minister is doing, their interests, their connections, their meetings, uh, basic things like ministerial and prime ministerial diaries being published so we can put together. And if this is backed up with other stronger checks, things like making the uh, independent ministerial advisor um, more independent, giving them a link back to Parliament, as even John Major suggested, so that it's not just about the Prime Minister deciding, then these in the interim could definitely make some sort of difference, or at least, as you'd want to, make a Prime Minister think twice. I think the impeachment idea is interesting. The slight danger with impeachment is that it kind of psychologically makes us think that the Prime Minister is a president again, um, and so there'd need to be some careful consideration. And then, meanwhile, I'd be strongly supportive of what Anthony said about uh, deliberation. I think there's been lots of successful examples in the UK around Brexit and climate change on citizens' assemblies, so that we build the constitution through a constitutional convention and things like citizens' assemblies, and with a, a kind of very strong awareness of the way in which the UK is um, a set of countries with multiple identities and make sure that there's something that reflects and kind of embraces all those multiple identities simultaneously. So transparency, more powerful checks, particularly from Parliament, would be a good combination in the interim before we think about a written constitution, I'd say. Thank you. Thank you very much for those. Now, that was the first question. We do have others. We have about we have about 40 minutes or so before we want to think about uh, wrapping this up. Um, now, can I see whether we are able to spotlight people in the audience? Because if we are, then I'd very much like to ask yeah, Sandy. Can uh, excellent. Can we ask Sandy Martin to ask a question then? Sandy Martin has a question, I think. Yes, uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, I, I, I didn't... Uh... I didn't actually have a question ready, but um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, because uh, this has been mentioned, whether we believe that the current electoral system makes it possible to build a sufficient coalition to be able to achieve the changes in democracy that we want. Thanks very much for that. So that, you know, so that's very much you know, taking it back to, you know, what the electoral system is at the moment. You know, does it make it possible to achieve these? Um, could I... Could I go to Hannah first on that? Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I mean, I think, as I said, um, 
I think the current electoral system makes it pretty difficult to get to this um, to the to a situation where this is something that one of the political parties would choose to prioritize. And I think that we would that that political parties would be more likely to go for electoral reform before they went for a full scale um, uh, written constitution. I think, I mean, this is something Ben very kindly referred to my book, which is very much focused on uh, Parliament and what's, what's called what's wrong with the House of Commons. And one of the things um, I look at there is how much uh, the problems that I see in the House of Commons are perpetuated by the, the two party system and the fact that there are just no incentives for reform or change of procedures because of the risk that those in some way disincentivize the part of the parties in power. In fact, actually, it's worse than that. It's often also the opposition parties who are looking forward to their next period in power, who also oppose some things which would be beneficial for Parliament as an institution, because they can see that when they're next you know, in government, they actually wouldn't want to have given up this power or that power or the other. So I think there's a, there's a direct read across an analogy to the constitution um, in general, and I think that's uh, quite a lot of, um, uh, there would be quite a lot of resistance uh, under our current system and a lack of incentive for the, as I said, significant political capital which would be required to embark on a process like this um, to come under, under our current system. Thank you. Um, ben, uh, would you like to add anything particular to that? Um, I think, Sandy, the answer to your question is no, <laughs> very briefly. Um, it's not suitable. Um, and I always find it a very strange anomaly when I'm teaching British politics to remember that there really is only the UK Parliament that is now using first past the post. And every other democratic institution in the United Kingdom uses a different system in some form. Thank you. Um, and lastly, to Anthony, what do you think? Well, the thing about the, the, I mean, I completely agree with what Hannah and Ben have just said and what Hannah has described very, very eloquently. Uh, you know, the first past the post system is to the victor the spoils, as um, Dennis Skinner uh, vividly described it in a positive way. I was very shocked. Um, Thatcher was in power and you felt that she was just laughing up her sleeve. And I was extremely disappointed, I and mean, I thought more than disappointed, that Corbyn, uh, for all his radicalism, wouldn't even willing to commit the Labour Party at that point to, uh, um, you know, to proportional representation. Well, he understood very well that the German system would have preserved a constituency, which he was concerned about, and given us a PR system with a proper 5%, you know, security. So. Um, how do you how do you break a system where those who spent their life in politics as Anna described are desperate for the spoils even the opposition and won't break from uh from that um mm. if i just add because i think this is a very such a big issue you know one big shift that's taken place over the last 20 years is that the labor party as a party the constituency parties have all voted in favour of having PR. Uh, they did so at the last Labour Party conference. And now the trade unions have shifted. And so there is a majority in the Labour Party, and there's hope from the within the Labour Party that there will be a majority vote in favour of, of committing the Labour Party to proportional representation at the party conference. And the leadership you know, Starmer, Mandelson, etc., are absolutely set against this. Um, and uh, it's very unlikely that they're willing to go to the public calling for that. What's important about it, and I think we need to emphasise, this isn't emphasised enough by reformers, is that while we look at it in a kind of, if you like, instrumental or transactional way. We won't get these kind of rational processes or better processes until we get it. What it does is it empowers voters. And that's what its appeal is not that you will get a, uh, you know, you'll get this or that outcome, but it gives you the power, your vote to count. 
And until the political parties are willing to empower voters, then this isn't going to happen. And one of the big things that comes between this is the media, because the Daily Mail and the Sun and the Telegraph, for all of their populist rhetoric, are not are not in favour of. They like the existing system. To the victor, the spoils is right up Murdoch's street, you know, and and uh, and the culture and the language that that goes with they hate coalition they hate negotiations they you know it doesn't sell newspapers all that sort of thing and 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 that's that's a big part of our political culture now that so, is a good point you know that the uh that the media you know the media uh has a huge influence in politics um, so I'm going to try and move us on to the next question simply because of uh, time. And this is the thing where I wish we could sit around in the pub and just you know, discuss this all evening. But I wondered whether we could see uh, whether Rosalind Kent is still in the audience, because Rosalind Kent uh, did ask a question about how we recognise someone. So, uh, uh, Rosalind, did you want to ask your question about how we recognise a potentially rogue prime minister? Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. Good. Um, yes, well, it is just as my question states. Um, I'm thinking not only in terms of prime ministers, but presidents and people like Putin, who rather resembles Hitler to me. If these people could have recognized for the danger they were, what destruction would have been prevented? My goodness. So, so, how, so how, yeah. do we, how do we recognize? Yes, let's ask, uh, could I uh, send that to Ben first then? You know, do you think there's anything that will help us to recognise uh, potentially rogue uh, people in power? Well, <laughs> I'm going to actually back up what Anthony said there. I mean, one of the things about Boris Johnson, one of the really remarkable things about Boris Johnson, was that we all knew what he was like before he became Prime Minister. And it's the old adage, you know, if someone shows you how they are, believe them. And I think it is also connected not just to the political system, but I think very importantly to what Anthony said there about the media and Boris Johnson and rogue prime ministers and rogue politicians more generally, and I'm thinking here of Berlusconi and Trump, are enabled by other people and other politicians and, you know, as they call it, the party and the media and elsewhere, sports and media, enabled and allowed to behave in a rogue fashion. One of the truly depressing things about watching what happened with Boris Johnson, similar again to Berlusconi, was the way in which all of their behaviour, which was very objectively and obviously rogue or challenged all sorts of democratic values, were then turned into political arguments. And this idea of accusations about, you know, it being a, an attack on their on their character and other things. I think actually we need to be hyper aware and hypercritical about there's something to be said about the way in which they're elected via parties, the way in which there are hustings, the amount of scrutiny that they are put, you know, connected to as they. Um, become leaders. There's been some very interesting work in the House of Lords about that way in which we need to rethink how our media functions. The erosion of things like local democracy, local media and regional media could also uh, be an issue here. But the, but the really depressing thing about lots of these leaders, I mean, Silvio Berners, you know, where his interests were and what sort of leader he was going to be before he arrived. And that's before we even discussed Donald Trump, who made it extraordinarily clear just exactly what sort of leader he would be. And, you know, people kind of fooled themselves or duped themselves or believed in, in partisan ways that they wouldn't be like that, and they were. That's an excellent point. Um, could I go to Anthony next and then to Hannah, trying to shake up the order a little? So, Anthony, do you have anything to add to that? Because it was your yeah, comment. But very sparkles. briefly, we know them when we see them. We knew them. We don't need it. It's not a difficult process to recognise them. The difficulty is why are people feel so desperately disbelieving in the larger political system that they think they're the solution? That's an excellent question. Uh, Hannah, what about your take on this? Yeah, I think I just agree with that. what Anthony said there. We sort of, one of the depressing things about our system is that we, is that the electorate constantly thinks, well, this, 
this person will be better and different when actually we have basically the same system delivering us the people. And so it's, it's slightly illogical to think they will be different. The other thing I think is, is, is tricky is that, you know, the vast majority of people don't spend their time thinking about constitutional norms and whether they've been broken. I was really struck when uh, a, a broadsheet newspaper, the Financial Times, came to me um, during Partygate and asked, would I write an article on why it matters if a prime minister lies to parliament? <laughs> and I was like, well, yes. <laughs> Very happy to write that article. It's slightly depressing that I need to write the article um, and that the readers of the Financial Times can't kind of uh, compute for themselves and you know obviously I could sort of go into the detail but I think some of the um, first principles around what is important within the constitution aren't self-evident to people I mean not because they're not intelligent enough to, to, to think about it they just don't have the time and space in their lives and the inclination to think about it and therefore some of the stuff that happens where the likes of, of, of Anthony and Ben and and, and uh, Jessica and 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 uh, people are not democracy sort of think, gosh, this is terrible. Um, uh, including, let's go back to the prorogation of Parliament. And you know, the other question I was asked well, is, could I? I went on the radio. Could I spell prorogation? Because you know, it was not the word that anyone has encountered. And and I spent a lot of time explaining why it mattered. And so, if if when things are done, you have to sort of start from the first principles to explain to the public of, of why that is a thing that should be of concern. You've lost 99% of them by the time you've got to the end of that radio interview because they've got something more important in their lives to deal with. So the, the idea of sort of generating a groundswell of public concern about this, I think you can get it within parties and maybe that's enough to therefore, as, as Anthony's been describing, say, for example, you know, the Labour Party growing support for PR, maybe then that eventually, maybe once they've won an election under the old system, might start to be uh, something that the Labour Party leadership could start to, to turn towards. But I, I think we, given the lack of sort of civic um, education that we have invested in really in this country and and the, the the difficulty for people of understanding how it's supposed to work and what's important we shouldn't wait for that impetus to come from the public thank you i mean there were definitely questions about the uh the lack of uh the lack of uh the lack of education about your know, politics and about the process and i think that that's a very very useful point to be made there. Um, could I ask whether we could spotlight Peter Buckman, who asked a question about a citizen's assembly and whether we could come up with a, um, um, well, uh, let me ask Peter to ask his question because it was about citizen's assemblies and about the electoral system. So Peter, are you there? Are you able to unmute? He does have the power to do that. It might not be. Uh -huh. uh, let me see. Oh, if I can find the question. Let's um, see. Uh, the question was about pleading for a citizens' assembly. Uh, so, Peter, it, it doesn't look like Peter's able to unmute. Uh, but his question was about pleading for a citizens' assembly to come up with uh, the most effective. Uh, um, system, you know, so looking at electoral systems, you know, the most equitable and the most effective electoral system, but equally finding a way of holding politicians accountable between elections. So something like citizens juries, he was saying. So not just the best electoral system, but also something to hold politicians accountable between elections. And he was suggesting something like a citizens assembly uh, to come up with that process. Uh, can I ask, uh, can I go to Anthony first to ask what what you would think about this sort of suggestion? Well, I, I, I'm very much in favour of having constitutional processes taken out of the House of Commons and, and placed into independent assemblies or deliberative assemblies, provided 
there is a number of MPs, the representative number of MPs are included in it or sit within it, have voice in it, and it's not seen as, as simply against them. So it needs to be integrated uh, so that they're listening and they can influence it. Uh, uh, the Icelandic experience of creating constitutional convention outside the political system went to the political system and then they just said, well, we don't like it. So you need to be able to say to an assembly, we're giving you these powers. And then the process will come back to the elected assembly and then presumably go to a referendum. So that's what happened in Ireland with the uh, the political parties, and it was partly the electoral outcome, could not resolve quite basic issues of uh, abortion and gay marriage, and, and that went to a citizen assembly process. Now, the point about a citizen assembly process is it does need to be well run. It needs itself all of Ben's points about transparency. It should be live streamed, uh, and, and it, it needs to be moderated so that the wisdom of people uh, can, can be given full expression. And I take Hannah's very powerful point about the fact that there's very little civic education. And if you start talking about prerogative powers, everybody kind of thinks, well, what's all this about? I mean, constitutions are for lawyers at the technical side, but the spirit, I think there is a, there is a wisdom and a practicality. The difficulty about them is that they do mean that the politicians who spent their lives getting elected have to let go. I have to say, at some by, by on some force, we're letting go of this outcome, and it will then be decided by other processes. And if I can tell a funny story about this, when Gordon Brown came in, he collaborated with Open Democracy through Michael Wills, his Minister of Justice, to try and produce a new constitutional settlement, which he then backed off, unfortunately. And um, Michael Will said to him, well, we need to have citizens jurors to listen, to, you know, as part of this. And then he told me this is this is a long time ago. So, I mean, that was private. But I mean, you know, she said, you know, Brown came back to him one day and said, well, I've had a citizen's jury. And, and you know, went to Bristol. You know, really, says Michael Will. Yes, you know, I went down to Bristol and I talked to them. <laughs> well, now. Uh, you know, it, this was the, I mean, I have a rather soft spot for Gordon Brown, but he, he, and I think he's a genuine, I don't think he's corrupt, and I think he has a genuine concern for people that are poor. He want, He's an egalitarian in a quite fundamental and important way, but he couldn't let go. He's a control freak. He could not let go. He couldn't, he he, he wanted a democratic outcome, but he wanted to make sure that the outcome was one that he wanted to control of. So it, it broke the, the energy. And, and that's it. The thing is, it was to his great credit that he tried. You know, he could saw something else was needed. Your Jack Straw and other people that he worked with were, were completely cynical and manipulative and, and Mandelson, and they wouldn't have any time for it at all. They couldn't, and they, and they outmaneuvered him. So that even when the desire is there, the, um, uh, uh, to get them to work, what, 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 what our questioner wants, uh, um, it, there, there has to be a willingness of the political class to say, we need something else. That's very good. I think that bit about letting go is particularly apt there. You know, politicians tend not to want to let go of power. <laughs> Can I pass it over to Ben and then to Hannah? Um, so, you know, so this is about you know, coming up, you know, using a citizens assembly to come up, you know, with an electoral system, you know, but also finding a way of holding politicians accountable between elections, such as, you know, citizens juries. I just to answer the, maybe the second part of Peter's question because Anthony answered the first part really well. This is the idea of between election democracy, which is an issue that's been discussed across democracies in the West and elsewhere. Um, and it's a bit tricky because at the end of the day, the only game in town is an election. And yes, there should be ways of holding politicians account to account between elections, but it has to be a balance between holding them to account if they behave badly 
this is complete the mandate that has, after all, been handed to them by the people. And I think the United States is both a good and a bad example of this. There's lots of different recall legislation in the United States where you can, between an election, attempt to remove a politician or challenge him. The problem is that both this and something like impeachment could easily be abused or misused uh, in a political sense. So I think there are options available. The UK, the Recall Act, um, which Hannah mentioned, is very narrowly drawn so that it can only happen in very, very particular circumstances when a politician has, has done a, a particular thing. Um, just to leave one idea from the project I've been doing, where I looked at how people are using new data to hold politicians to account, I did find that actually websites like theyworkforyou.com, where you can see what individual MPs have been doing in terms of their voting record, their activity, the presence of that data does interestingly have some sort of effect on how MPs behave. If they feel they are being watched, they do actually, to an extent, behave themselves to a particular degree. So I wonder whether there could be a kind of improvement and a sharpening of transparency mechanisms that means politicians know they're being monitored without overly kind of interfering or endangering, as it were, the mandate that at the end of the day, they have been given uh, democratically. Thank you. And uh, finally to Hannah. Just to follow up on that point that, that Ben made about mechanisms like they work for you. I distinctly remember when I was working in the House of Commons, the people who worked in the table office, which is, is where parliamentary <clears throat> questions get put down, bemoaning the fact that when they work for you started work, essentially the immediate effect was for them to receive an enormous number of what they called round robin questions, which are where an MP asks a question and asks the same question to every government department, regardless of whether they're actually interested in the answer, that, because it gets their statistics up in terms of the number of questions that they can be shown to have asked. So we do have to be a bit careful, I think, in terms of transparency about what we count and what we count as, you know, useful and, and whether we drive perverse um, uh, given every parliamentary co question costs, uh, I think then it was about £500 uh, on average for a government department to answer uh, whether we drive the wrong sorts of uh, behaviour through some of that. But I'm totally with Ben in terms of you know, the value of, of transparency in general. Um, and I only wanted to just agree with uh, Anthony's uh, first point. I think there is a real um, need for our representative democracy to get used to the idea that actually people want more involvement in their democracy now and they've had a taste of it through referendums uh, which may or may not have been conducted um, uh, in, in the best possible way in order to produce an outcome which uh, could command everybody's confidence but you know i've had exactly the same type of conversation with mps where you sort of say and you know i declare an Personally, I declare an interest here as a, as a trustee of the, the charity involved, which is all about participation and, and, and deliberation. Um, but, you know, you say to them, well, how about your select committee makes more use of some kind of these sorts of techniques? Um, and they say, but, you know, we don't need them because that's what we're for. You know, we are constituency MPs. We spend our time talking to people. Uh, our, the system is that we then bring that knowledge and understanding of what's going on and what people think into Parliament. Um, and they just don't get the uh, the, the value um, that can be brought by these processes. Um, and so getting them to to not feel threatened, um, I think, by, by the ways in which deliberative participative processes could um, actually enhance uh, representative democracy, not doing it in a kind of tokenistic way, where these, these are processes which sort of sit outside here, and we, as, as Anthony said, we do, we don't listen to them, and we say we've done it, and therefore, you know, we may read the report or not, but, you know, it's got to be, we, Parliament needs to seriously reflect on how th these processes can um, uh, give greater legitimacy and uh, uh, improve the outcomes of the sorts of scrutiny and so on that the Parliament engages in. Thank you. Now, it's it's just gone 10 past. Um, now, I'd like to try combining two questions. I know I was going to highlight a couple of people, but we've got two questions which I think could be uh, kind of combined because, you know, they're both 
what would the role be for you know for such and such and uh jonathan brewster did ask you know what role the courts should play but equally catherine gregory uh did ask what role uh the house of lords could play and this is a reformed house of lords rather than the current house of lords so i wondered if i could throw that straight back to hannah if you mind um, firstly, you know, what role, what role should the courts play, you know, and that's the courts as they are at the moment. And secondly, what role could a reformed House of Lords play? And thank you to, uh, to Jonathan for his question, to Catherine for hers, which I've combined. Yeah, so it's, it's absolutely true that in my, my list of, of people who can play a role in sort of um, potentially removing um, at least sanctioning uh, what people deem to be a rogue prime minister. The courts um, certainly do have a role, as we saw with prorogation, uh, where they came in to, to talk about, well, what are the boundaries of the prerogative, which wasn't something that, you know, was necessarily legally clear that they would take a, a, a position on, but did decide to do so. Um, so there's that kind of where we have executive prerogatives that they exercise, we, we now think that the courts uh, have defined for themselves a role in uh, determining where the boundaries of those sit and what it is and isn't reasonable um, uh, to use them for. Um, so that is one way in which we've seen the courts play a role. Uh, of course, they also, you know, where there are aspects of our um, constitution which uh, do sit in, in in laws which have been passed by Parliament. The courts play can play a role, um, uh, and you know we see judicial review and so on in in looking at decisions that have been made by by ministers and and whether those have been properly made. Um, but ultimately, I think one of the problems uh, to go back to the first past the post system and the 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 fact that it tends to end up with uh, although not lately, but has tended to, to, to end up with a, a large majority for the governing party in Parliament. At the end of the day, if the government doesn't like uh, the laws which are and the way they've been interpreted by the courts, it can just change the laws. So in some respects, you know, the courts can only, um, you know, we have parliamentary sovereignty, sovereignty, you know, the, the final decision making with, with Parliament to set, uh, to pass any law to set um <clears throat> those legal boundaries so so at the end of the day the courts are interpreting the laws as as decided on by parliament so uh, a really rogue prime minister could pass laws which um might allow them to do things which uh, uh people would continue to think were, were rogue and the courts wouldn't be able to um to stop that um shall i i think i feel like i've heard my own voice quite a lot shall i s stop on that one and let somebody else uh answer the house of lords question uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I just, you know, looking at the time, and we're trying to get in as many opinions as possible. Um, so if I could go to Ben next, and then down to Anthony. Um, so, you know, what role, you know, what role could a reformed House of Lords have? And of course, you know, there's also, you know, what role, you know, could the courts have? Yeah, but of course, there are various other actors you might like to bring in as well. You know, we've I'm talked about the media, no one's talked about the Queen. So... I'm just going to sidestep the courts and maybe just focus on the House of Lords, given that Hannah covered it uh, so well. Uh, one of the obvious strange anomalies about British politics I always like to explain to my students is that the House of Lords has become a defender of some of the more vulnerable groups in society. And, so, and also, it's become a kind of constitutional guardian. So one of the reasons that a House of Lords power should be bolstered is that its kind of constitutional guardianship could be increased. Um, and it would also, at the same time, perhaps become a House of Lords of the regions and more representative uh, of the UK as a whole. I mean, I'm thinking about what the House of Lords has tried to do with its very limited power and legitimacy under Boris Johnson even now. It attempted to, you know, stop or, or least the internal market bill, the controversial bill, which was going to, as the minister themselves admitted, break the law, uh, international law. Um, it also attempted to change and amend the elections bill, which Anthony mentioned. And now, as you've seen this week, is gearing up for, 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 for hopefully rather a large fight with the new prime minister around the Northern Ireland Protocol. 
bill as well. So we could imagine that a much more powerful House of Lords could be a much greater Czech uh, rogue prime minister. And I'm, one of the arguments against this, of course, is that it leads to legislative gridlock. But I'm not always convinced that that argument holds in a way that's what you'd expect people who are against it to say who don't want a limitation on their power. One of the really interesting things about the House of Lords and the House of Commons at the minute, again something I, I try and tell my students, is that actually often unhappiness in the House of Lords then moves back to the House of Commons and the two institutions sometimes exist in signaling symbiosis where what actually the House of Lords does is to flag a problem that then goes back to the House of Commons and it often becomes a problem there too. So um, I'd be very much in favour of a stronger House of Lords doing even more to stop uh, some of the things that happened with the rogue Prime Minister. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, could I go to Anthony last then? And, yeah. Yeah, this is the last question. Well, well, well I mean, uh, I co-wrote a book in the uh, little while ago called the, the Athenian Option, where I proposed at least part of the House of Lords be selected, the upper chamber be selected by lot, um, so that people could answer certain questions which would they would, would deliberate on. For example, is the legislation understandable? Is it written in a way that regular people could understand the laws? Which a jury could, in effect, a jury system could uh, and, and many MPs have no idea what they're voting on because legislation is put through in such a complicated and technical fashion. And another question which could be uh, considered is, will the laws actually deliver what the ministers who are advocating them say they will? So the example I gave, or we gave, was that when um, the Thatcher government abolished uh, uh, um, NHS abolished free eye tests in order to save money but eye tests were saving people from glaucoma and treating glaucoma is extremely expensive because it's life to long life so was it, would it in fact you know be economical in the overall system to um, abolish free eye tests there's a way in which that can be considered and then you listen to experts um but as for the the House of Lords, I mean, I think there's this on this whole issue. There's a very, very good book by Helen Ellen Landisman on the the framework and structure of uh, um, deliberative processes, and her argument is that there's a general crisis of representative democracy across the world. And that is rooted in the way in which it was created to organize consent, which is very important, and it protects us from fascism. But it was, but it was also all created in the 19th and 20th century to keep democracy at arm's length. And people now, Ellen has made this point as well, you know, they want to have, they want to participate, they want power. So we need to have processes. It's a fundamental issue, it's not just a tactical uh, uh, question there. And as for the courts, I'd simply say this. <clears throat> what is important is that none of us is above the law. And what the, so the sovereignty of Parliament says is, oh, yes, we are above the law. So Parliament claims that it is, in fact, the law, whatever it can do, whatever it likes. And that goes back to the, what was called the Imperial Parliament. You know, it could draw borders across Africa or India. It could... It could, you know, do whatever it liked. That's what an imperial parliament does. And now it's doing it to us. <laughs> and I object to this very strongly. So a constitutional process means that nobody, no institution and no framework is above the law, including the courts themselves. And then you have to say, well, how do we ensure that this legal process empowers us and doesn't empower big money and whatever? And that's the other aspect I would just say at the end of this, which is that underlying a lot of these issues is the role of money. So if you take in the United States, there's enormous support 80, across the Republicans as well against dark money and the role of money in elections. Uh, but the politicians who are getting that money and the press who are also part of that process are, are protecting dark money and its influence. And that's why people feel the system is not really representing them. 
And so that's part of this, this, this general crisis that's taking place. You can't, it's much more difficult to corrupt a deliberative process, especially one that's transparent. It's much more difficult to buy people who are not full-time, lifetime politicians. And, and we need representation. We need people who are expert. We need people like Helen and Ben to be able to help us with legislation and passing laws and see if they work. But we need a system which we feel can belong to us and, and, and doesn't belong to, to the rich. That, I think, is a uh, perfect note to end on. Um, I'm not sure I could have said that last bit better myself. You know, you've been saying it for a long time and you say it very well. And so thank you to all three of our panellists, um, to thank Hannah, to Ben, uh, to Anthony. Um, this has been a really interesting evening, really informative uh, for all of us. Now, can I go next to Tom, Tom Brake, just for a quick message, and then I'll come back for a general thanks and goodbye. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Jess. And I just wanted to, uh, to, to say, first of all, thank you to you for chairing the event. Uh, and uh, thank you. And you can do a much more comprehensive one to Ben and Hannah and, of course, Anthony. And I, I want to mention Anthony in particular because, of course, he, he was doing the, the role as director of Charter 88, which is the same one that I am doing 34 years later. Uh, and I just hope that I'm going to be as successful in my position as he was in his. So um, what I want, just wanted to flag up was that uh, Unlock Democracy, we are about to start on a, uh, a project that we, we're calling a la carte constitution. So we're going to be putting together what we hope is going to be a very user friendly app or an online, uh, a, an online uh, facility that people can access where people can create their own constitution. Um, the reason we're doing this is to try to popularize this subject and make it much more accessible to, to the public and flag up why uh, this is something that people should be uh, concerned about. And we're very pleased to be working with uh, Gopal Subraniniam, who was uh, uh, the Indian uh, Supreme Court on, on this. Uh, who is now based in the UK and some of the people working in his chambers. So I may want to come back to Anthony, Hannah and Ben at some point to ask for their input into this project. The other thing that I just wanted to mention very briefly is that we are running a project with Compass. So we do a lot of partnership work with different organisations in the democracy sector. And we're running a project at the moment called Powering Up, which we're about to rebadge cleaning up politics. And the focus of this is to try to ensure that come the next general election, hopefully all of the political parties, but probably more realistically, uh, Labour, Lib Dems and Greens, and uh, hopefully the SNP and Clyde, uh, have within their manifestos proposals around democratic reforms. Uh, and this is very much the focus of our work over the next uh, the next 12 months or certainly up to the next general election. And this uh, webinar is very much part of that process because some of the democratic reforms that we clearly need to see are the ones that we've been talking about tonight, might be a written constitution, certainly lots around the need for greater transparency and accountability and generally cleaning up our politics. So we can't be in uh, the position that we've been in for the last couple of years again uh, in the near future or hopefully ever again. So that's all I wanted to say and thank you again to everyone who's attended and uh, pass back to you Jess. Thanks very much. Uh, the only thing I think left for me to say would be that, um, well I mean thank you for coming everybody. There's a reminder that for those people who enjoyed tonight and would like to continue talking, um, then Tom will be holding a session next Thursday, um, the 8th of September, you know, so not tomorrow, but next week, um, which is at 7pm, which is sort of a Q&A session and a what can unlock democracy do? And this is a chance to input and to say, OK, these are the things we'd like to do. Um, you do have to be a member of Unlock Democracy to attend next Thursday's session. There's going to be a link in the chat to uh, to click for those people who are not members. Um, for those people who are already, you should have received something. Uh, there's a newsletter which goes out. It came out today. So you should have received a link there as well. And um, 
that is the best way to support the work we're doing, you know, because obviously these things all cost money. So, you know, please do support us to help, you know, to help change democracy, to build a better politics. And thank you very much to our three speakers. Thank you, thank you for all of your contributions. This has been a very enlightening evening. And let us hope we'll see you all again soon. So thank you, very, everybody. Very nice and goodbye. to meet you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.